Well, good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Scott Gregory. I am not Randy Barnhart. I'm as big as him, but I am not him. So he is not feeling well. He called me yesterday and asked if I could jump in the saddle and ride for him this morning. So that's what I'm doing. And I consider it an honor to be able to do so, to stand before you and to share some things with you. This morning, I've entitled my sermon, Dancing with God. Now, I don't know if you tapped your toe when you heard that music that came on a second ago, or you shook your head and wonder what in the world's getting ready to happen. Um, but uh, dancing with God is something that I just want to pour out. Just a few things, perhaps. I have no idea where you are in your journey of faith. Some of you are just beginning. Some of you have been at it a long time. But I think there's a few things that God can remind us of or help us to understand more about him this morning. I'm going to read a passage of just a short passage of scripture, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump in. Does that sound fair? Let's pray. I'm going to read the passage first. Didn't I say I just, see, I'm, I'm right there with Billy. Uh, I need some of that medication. Out of Psalm 30, the writer writes, You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and closed me with joy. Let's pray. God, this morning we come before you as gracious and people who love you and care for you, care for you. But Father, more than anything, we know that you do the same for us. So today, God, may you open our hearts. May you peel back some of the things that we've been carrying and push them aside for a few moments. And may you hear a word this morning from you. Father, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth this morning, God, be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. I could not dance. Now it's not that I couldn't, it's the fact is that I wasn't going to. A prohibition against dancing had been declared by myself and several other male students at East Salem Elementary School. A part of our physical education curriculum was the most humiliating, degrading, disgusting thing that you could ever impose on a fifth grade male. Dancing. Not just dancing, but we had to dance with girls. Now please don't get me wrong, I like girls. But the only thing was I liked them as a fifth grader from a distance. I was five feet four, weighed 80 pounds. I was very intimidated by some of these girls who had probably began to develop and had gotten into adolescence a little earlier and began to fill out in places that caused me and my comrades to blush. So the conflict arose when our fifth grade class was studying folk music. And as a part of the curriculum was to learn how to square dance. How many of y'all had to get, got to do that, all right? Now I was a very proud Virginian, and I still am. But I have to hang my head this morning in shame because the fact that the Old Dominion has a dance entitled the Virginia Reel. That Wednesday afternoon was it. We had had it. We were divided into foursomes. The teacher put on this record of Hillbilly Fiddler and tried to get 30 12-year-olds to follow directions. The worst part, of course, was the occasional swing your partner. Now, when you had to do that, the necessity was you had to hold hands with the person of the opposite sex, and that put me way out of my comfort zone. Now, I giggled through it, I struggled through it, uh, but the true confession is it, it was lots of fun, especially when compared to going back and taking a spelling test or doing multiplication tables. Dancing was a lot more fun, but as the music stopped and the fun ended, the awkwardness, that's when reality set in. So a few of my buddies and I vowed it was over. No more dancing for us. So we put our heads together and, conduct, and concluded that we would all have our parents write notes <laughs> so that the teacher could excuse us from this disgusting, this, 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 this distasteful event that we had that we were forced to do. Well, the next week on Wednesday was our time with our physical edge teach, PE teacher, and so on Tuesday night, I had my mom write a note. It read probably something like this. Dear Mrs. Arnold, 
Scott does not like dancing, and I don't see where it has much to do with physical education. Please excuse him from any further dancing at school. <laughs> Yours truly, Mr. and Mrs. Gregory. Well, armed with this little note, I marched off to school the next day, handing it over to my teacher. I braced myself for her response, but all I got was a smile. Ms. Arnold said, oh, oh, well, that's fine. I can only imagine what was going to be said in the teacher's lounge later on that day about a kid who brought a note about dancing at school, especially since I was the only guy who brought a note. <laughs> My fellow comrades had bailed on me. I was the lone ranger taking on this whole thing about abolishing dancing. All, Ms. Arnold was so nice. All, all, all she did in her wisdom, I think, was quickly ask me to operate the record player. You guys remember what those things were? <laughs> Not humiliating me, no embarrassment, just a stroke to save me. I became the musical director for the, for, for the entire class. That's the only instrument I've ever learned to play. <laughs> there I sat, putting the needle on and off the record, whenever she commanded me, tapping my toe, and sometimes I would sit behind my buddies and act like I was fiddling, making fun of them. And the rest of the kids would stumble around, swinging your partner and doing the dosy -si do and all that kind of stuff. So there I sat week after week, watching everyone else dance and began to build a conviction in my, in my mind and many other things like you, you probably have done these. I concluded that real Christians don't dance or smoke, or chew, or drink, or goof off, or run in church, or laugh in church. And you guys, you probably have created your own list of things you can't do as a Christian. Now you can imagine my surprise when later on, when I started looking into the scripture a little bit deeper, I read this account from 2 Samuel 6, verses 13 through 14. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephah, danced before the Lord with all of his might. <laughs> there it was. Big, bold, black and white print right there in my Bible. One of the greatest men of all times was dancing. Not only that, he was dancing in his undergarment before the Lord. I thought, wow. That's an interesting thing. And then later on, I discovered another passage. You remember the story about a wayward son who squandered his inheritance only to discover that there was no place like home. So he wrapped himself up, took himself home, but what you may not have noticed was there was a party that was going on that was thrown in his honor. And it says in Luke 15, verse 25, Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Now I've got to ask this question. Who was in the house dancing? What does what dancing sound like? In a few verses later, I find out it was none other than the prodigal's father. My son, in, verses 15, in, verse, in Luke 15, 31 and 32, my son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and now is alive. He was lost and he's now found. Now the standard interpretation of this parable is that the sons represent mankind. They represented us. They represent people who decide they want to do things their own selves. And the father represents God. And if that's true, guess what? God is inviting us to come and dance with him. Now there's a partner to get in line for. Just imagine. God invites us into intimacy with himself. He calls us into celebration. And everything he calls us into that's good and glorious. And he asks us not that we stay at arm's length, but rather he pulls us in tight and close and, takes to, and talks to us. And he takes us on a dance for our lifetime. And what is it like to dance? So what's it like to dance with God? 
Dancing with God is allowing him to take your breath away as he whirls us through the dark and the light places as life leads us. He's there. It's relaxing in his embrace and trust will, um, trusting fully in his strong arms. It's releasing the power of the Spirit within us to give us joy beyond ourselves. It's rejoicing out loud at the grace and the beauty of God as he provides and ignores us, as, we, as he provides those things, and as we ignore the crowds to help us sit down and quit smiling, quit grinning. But above all else, dancing with God is learning to let go. I discovered early on in life, and probably you, an importance of having something to hold on to. My daughter had this, what's that, a bunny rabbit that she loved the fuzz off of. We still have it today. It's in a bag because if you touch it, it would disintegrate. But she hung on to that thing. And we all discovered there's something, whether it's our mother's skirt, handlebars on our bicycle, and when we hear, hold on tight, we just grip onto that thing as hard as we can. Our nerve endings begin to twitch, and man, we hold on for, all, for everything that we have in our being. We cling to control. We cling to security for all their worth. We clutch power and priorities and property until our, our hands turn white from hanging on to those things. When danger threatens, uh, we might grab a gun or we might grab somebody's hand and we might do something, run in, in, until the storm passes. Hence, you can see the problem that arises when God invites us to dance. He holds out his hand and waits. And the very act of taking his hand demands that we learn to let go of everything else. And some things in particular have to be released before we can take the hand of God. I just want to give you a few of those things that I think are important. Now you might have other ones. But the first one, I think before we can begin to dance with God, we have to let go of fear. Experience is, is, is a stern but effective teacher. She has taught us well that you must keep one foot on the shore at all times. It's dangerous out there. Can't do that. Unexpected tragedies can pop up, pop the balloons of joy and squelch away uh, uh, things in our life. Uh, an unexpected thing, the screech of a tire, the word cancer from a doctor. She says, you can't go dancing off into tomorrow without safety, without a net to catch you, and some insurance. It's just not prudent to do those things. You've got to hang on. Yet there God stands with his hand outstretched. And he calls us onto the dance floor with nothing more than a promise. A promise we hear in John 14, 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus makes it clear that we choose whether or not we have troubled hearts. It's a decision we make. Worry and fear may feel involuntary, but it's a choice that we make. It's a decision that we make. They are something we act out upon every day. It is within our power to let go of our fear and take hold of the hand of God. Don't worry, the Savior says. He commands his disciples, do not worry. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me. There's no benefit found in it unless gray hairs and sleepless nights are a treasure for you, or no hair and sleepless nights. You cannot dance with God and cling to our fears. You cannot enjoy the roller coaster if you're wondering whether or not the bolts and the thing are going to fall apart when you ride. But there are those determined to try. Poor souls who creep into the dance floor, winced as they get into the invitation, they kind of crawl out on the dance floor for a time. They keep step with the Spirit, but soon they are uneasy, and the things of life overtake them. They're the ones in church who look like they're on their way to the dentist's office rather than to heaven. If you're tired, if you try dancing like this, you know why you're 
you wear those pained expressions when you come in. We had this lady in the church I used to work at before, sweet lady, but we always said, Lucy, we're going to have to stand you on your head to see you smile. <laughs> it's awfully uncomfortable to dance when you're always looking over your shoulder. But letting go of fear isn't a snap. It doesn't happen real easy. Fear is like gum. It sticks to. It sticks to everything. It gets on everything. And where shall I put this fear if I do not let go of it? Listen to what the Apostle Peter encouraged us to put in place and what to do. He said, you put your hand in the Father's hand. In 1 Peter 5, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand and he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I've heard some of us use this verse to describe laying all your burdens down at the throne of God. We even kind of sang about it this morning. I've tried this. I've tried putting him down at the throne. But I, I, I run into some difficulties, and I'll just confess this morning, as Billy did. You see, when I lay my burden at his feet, I have a strong tendency when I'm doing that to explain the trouble that I have at the feet of Jesus. I want to explain to him why I'm putting it there. As I stand there giving my weak explanation, which he got, he, Jesus knows anyway, God knows anyway, I, I find I can't leave it there. I can't let go of it. So I walk back out of the throne room, still clutching to my fear, and that's why the word cast has a special meaning to me. When I read this passage, it says, Put your, and cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The term is often used to describe hoisting a burden onto the back of an animal. Yet it also carries it with the notion of throwing it. Just like throwing a stone, you cast a stone. He is simply saying, not necessarily lay my troubles down. He instructs us to throw them. That way, when you're... When they're out of your hands, when you throw it, it's gone. You still don't have anything hanging on. Sometimes the only thing that works is to run into the presence, chuck your fears at, the, at, at Jesus' feet, the throne, and run back out before you change your mind. That's how I have to do things. Fear. Before you're going to dance with God, you have to get rid of the fear. And another thing you have to do in order to properly dance with God is to let go of the reins. The old cliche confirms that you can lead a horse to water, but can't make him drink. But that's a lot more than you can say about many of us as humans. Though great leaders are highly praised and strong leadership is sought for country and community alike, there is an inerrant problem with leading. It requires that someone has to follow Maybe that's why Jesus selected his followers with a simple statement. He came to them, he found them, and he said simply, follow me. If they could have submitted to being, to bring, if they were not submitted to being followers, they would have never been able to dance with God. Call it eccentric if you like, but God loves to lead. And God expects to lead. And God requires us to allow him to lead. This is no new requirement of God's followers. When Abraham was summoned by God way back in the Old Testament and to leave all that he knew and trust before his father, God, he, 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 he had to do something. Abraham wasn't given a compass or a map to guide him. He was asked to follow God's lead, and he gladly handed God the reins. As the Hebrew writer put it in Hebrews 11, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Did you all catch what he said? Abraham gave loose of the reins and went, what? Even though he did not know where he was going. I love those words. They are unashamedly honest. There's no pretense there. Think of it. Here's Abraham, a man of great wealth. He packed up all of his belongings, gave a tearful goodbye to his family. He hugged his brothers Nahor and Haran and kissed his father Terah. And the last he saddled up his donkey and set off for where? 
Which way do I ride? We are told that he left without the slightest idea of where he was going. How many of y'all do that when you go on a trip? He didn't even worry about how many pairs of underwear to pack up. He just got on his donkey or whatever he was riding and he was gone to follow God. And I don't know how many of us could have handled that one. After all of that, we tell your neighbors when they ask, so we, well, can you imagine this? You start packing up your house and you're going to move and people come over and go, where are you going? And you say, I don't know. I have no idea. Wouldn't you feel kind of foolish I have no idea. I have the foggiest idea. God just told us to move. Yet that's when the dancing starts. The moment we truly surrender the throne of our lives and give God control is the moment of discovery. It's then and when we feel the joy and release found in not being in charge anymore. We experience the peace and the relaxation of having someone else at the wheel. Only then and only then, at that time can we let go of the reins and really begin to dance. For with the freedom that releasing control begins, we are allowing God to lead us, and we begin to follow. There's just one more thing that I want to tell you before we get out of here. Still. If you want to allow God to lead, and if you want to dance with God, letting go of guilt is the last thing that you have to do, or one of the things. Feeling guilty and dancing can't be done at the same time. Neither can it be enjoyed. Dancing is a joyous by nature, while guilt, on the other hand, is depressing by nature. Dancing is intertwined with the celebration and the exaltation, while guilt is, is to recall of bad choices and the things that we have, if we'd have made better choices, if we hadn't done this, we had, thus letting go of guilt must come before any attempt to join in the divine before we can dance with God. While letting go of guilt may sound much less unpleasant than letting go of the reins, an astonishing number of Christians find this the most difficult thing to release in their life. They have a bit, we have a difficult time to accept our own acceptance. Maybe they have misunderstand Christ's work in your life. Often we spend days and months and perhaps years a, a rolling around in our guilt and when we sing hymns and lyrics like, For such a worm as I. Y'all remember that one? Who wants to dance with a worm? Granted, we are guilty creatures. Without Christ, there is no hope for us. But this bad news is not where the curtain falls. God sent Christ to earth to take us, to take the sin and the guilt and the world upon his shoulders, and this means mine and yours. His blood, on, it, <clears throat> his blood on Calvary paid for all of our sins, the big ones, the small ones, the ones <clears throat> that we will commit today, the ones that we'll commit in the future. Imagine that, that God is already going to forgive the sins that we are going to, we haven't even thought about committing yet. There's an ultimate sacrifice that we're able not only to stand before God guilt-free, but to join him in the celebration of dancing. Our guilt is released to the Father through the blessing of what we call, it's a, church, it's a churchy word, forgiveness. <clears throat> if I ask you to define what forgiveness is, you would probably go, ah, it's simply this. Forgiveness is choosing not to get even when you have the right to do so. And that's what God does for us. He looks at us. He looks at me because he looks at me through the blood of his son and the, son of his, the blood of his son and says, I choose not to get even. I choose to take Scott's sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. Even though I have a right to punish him because my son has taken his place. Our guilt is released to the Father. The very sound of that word should set your feet tapping that I'm forgiven. It's the sweetest note of all. My slate is clean and I am free. And David knew the double blessing of forgiveness when he composed his own hymn about past guilt, which is probably from the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. And he put it this way in Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
He said a little later on in that same passage, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away and my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin and you and <clears throat> I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. <clears throat> David rejoices in the hidden blessing of God's forgiveness. Not only did God forgive the sin, he forgave the guilt as well. David no longer carried the black bag of guilt around on his neck, but he laid it, he threw it, he cast it before the Lord, and he gave it to God. Will you allow God to take that little bag that you carry all of your hidden secrets and all of your sins, your fears, your guilt, your, your lack of forgiveness? I know you are worthy of such a blessing because God says we are. So go ahead. Put everything that you carry around in there. Put it in that thing and throw it at the feet of God. Let go of the guilt and you have carried around perhaps for years. Maybe even decades. And while you're at it, handing over all the fears of your life, letting him have the reins of your life, don't make him proud that sings out of your fingers. <coughs> Don't make, him turn, make you turn loose. Let go of it all. You'll dance a whole lot better if you don't have your arms full. Besides, you'll need both hands empty to take care of his hands. Don't sit against the wall of life. Don't sit back in the dark corner all alone. Because when God stands in front of you, with his hand extended, he's leaning down and whispering in your ear, would you like to dance? Father, thank you so much for an invitation to dance with you in eternity. Father, as a fifth grader, I was scared of the idea. But now as an old man, I look forward to you taking my hand and be dancing with you in eternity. Father, this morning there may be people here who have never taken your hand, who have never learned to walk and talk and dance with you. May today be that day that they would let go of all the fear in their life, that they would hand over the reins of their life to you. And Father, you would take their guilt away through the forgiveness of your son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.